Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their advice. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about autism stories. I've been thinking about the history of the neurodiversity movement in the autistic community a lot, and that's why I was excited to recently find the autistic archive, which chronicles much of this history dating back to the 1990s. Ira Idol is the creator of this website, and I get the chance to talk to Ira about his website, Autistic Inclusive Meets USA, and much more. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Ira, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. Wanted to start out and learn where does your story in the autistic community begin? I guess it technically begins from like mid high school when I was on Facebook and I was I, I asked myself I wonder if there are groups autistic people have started. So I joined a Facebook group called Autistics Worldwide. I wasn't really active in it though. I I was just kind of there, and then I started actually being active in late 2018, there were several key events that mobilized me. I'll talk about this a little later, but being a theater major, I thought that I had a play I wanted to write, and I thought there's more I wanted to learn about autism. I also, I was in this performance project called the Our Town Collision Project, and we, um, I was already, like, I think I was just starting to think, because I was involved with politics, and I started to think about, like, what is it like for autistic people like this? And, and then we went to the the Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta, in downtown Atlanta, and we like wrote about like it was my third time visiting there, but we reflected afterwards, and I, I wrote about it in my journal, and like I had heard about how horrible autism speaks was and how horrible ABA was, and I like I started writing about these things, like wow, I have some strong opinions. <laughs> Everything just happened from there. I just became like galvanized. I started to learn more and more, meet more people, and now I, I am where I am. The number of autistic Facebook groups have certainly changed since 2015. Yeah, there are plenty out there. I'm part of quite a few. Now, you recently got your bachelor's degree in theater and performance studies. What was it about theater and performance that led to you pursuing this degree? I did theater in high school. It wasn't related to being autistic. Though my desire to eventually write my own play about my life as an autistic person was one of the main things that motivated me to become more involved. So now I, I don't think I'll be finishing that play because I've found other interests, but it was the thing that I originally wanted to do. Now... While at uh, your university, you spent time as a peer mentor, attending classes with students uh, twice a week, checking in on their progress in class, and assisted them in note-taking. What did you see as some of the biggest challenges in the students you mentored? So the students I mentored were pretty responsible. I guess the one thing I noticed was them occasionally getting distracted, but I mean... Even I spent some time surfing the internet while with them. So I wasn't in that job for too long. I think got cut short because of COVID. And then when I came back to campus, I didn't particularly want to do it again. But it was nice while it lasted. Do you have any suggestions on how universities can better support students in achieving their academic goals? There's certainly a lot they can do. I think it goes beyond a simple laundry list of actions there are ways that the system is fundamentally designed that make it more difficult for students to get by. To list a few things, though, when it comes to higher ed specifically, so universities, I would say affordability 
and making learning materials more accessible are definitely like two really important two like huge barriers that students with disabilities face in academia. You know, in terms of accessibility, do you have any like things that happen that you were like, yeah, this really, you know, this really can be improved upon? Oh yeah, a lot of the readings I had for my courses were very wordy, were pretty long, and the language was hard to understand, especially like in some of my theater classes, we read some plays with like very unique language, I guess, and it was hard for me to sit down and read them and really understand what I was reading, and I feel like, I mean, I know that like for Shakespeare plays, there's no fear of Shakespeare, but yeah. I, I don't know if that's really the case for us. I would like using the internet to help me understand while well, talking about it in class. I guess this is also the case for some of the things I would read in my literature classes, uh, my, like my world literature class. There are really just a lot of materials in academia. Should There should be versions that are in plain language or that are easy to read. Like I feel like there are so many more things that need to be in that format because, I mean, that would obviously benefit students with disabilities, but that would also just benefit... A lot of students, because I know so many, I knew so many people at university who were like, eh, I didn't really read this because like I didn't have time or it was just too confusing to me. I feel like it's a lot of that is just because like the stuff that we're being presented with is just kind of hard for us to digest. It's stuff from years ago too, so like written by dead people. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, no, absolutely. Plain language is you know kind of one of those universal design things that helps everyone. Now, before you graduated, you were a uh, part of the Kennesaw State Tellers Ensemble, and you had a spring showcase in which you performed The Stars Were Aligned, which was a story you shared about attending the Artistic Self-Advocacy Network's 2019 gala, which I found very interesting. What were some of the things that you learned from this experience? I mainly learned the, uh, things about rehearsing. My piece was very much ready to go a week before the performances, and I learned that I didn't need to polish too much if I really didn't need to, because there is such thing as over-polishing, and then the delivery of it doesn't feel as natural, because you just rehearsed it for rote so much. I also learned a very simple rehearsal technique. That it's so simple you wouldn't even think about it, but it's like, it's very effective. It involves, you just run whatever, the piece, the scene, whatever, just run it from beginning to end three times without stopping, three times in a row. It really helps cement it when you do that. Another thing I learned after the show that was more related to the story itself was not idolize people too much. The people I met at the A.C. Gala are great people who are very accomplished, but they're just that, people. And I kind of talked about them like they were rock stars, I guess. <laughs> They're prone to the same mistakes as anyone else, and idolization can be just as dehumanizing as presuming incompetence. I mainly came to this realization through various conflicts that have been happening in autistic spaces in the past few months. It, it can be difficult to see people who are behind computer screens as more than their social media accounts. ASIN is still a great organization, in my opinion, but they are not gods. There are also many other autistic-led organizations that do great work in other areas. ASANS happens to be policy first and foremost, while like Communication First is more about non-speaking people who communicate with AAC, and uh, AWN does a lot more community engagement and is a lot more intersectionally minded, for example. And Thinking Person's Guide to Autism is more about journalism and blogging. So there's really like... I mean, all these work organizations work with each other in tandem, so it's not like you can only support one and not the other, but a sense thing is policy, and not everyone is going to be looking for that. When they want to look for a relevant autism organization, the policy might not necessarily be the thing that's on their mind, and that's okay. I'm actually getting the opportunity to perform this story again next week, and I'm going to find a way to incorporate how, like... These are still people I met who are just as prone to the mistakes that someone like me would make because they're humans like I am. I think that's a, definitely a great update for, for that. 
I was excited to talk to you today because I love talking to people from theater backgrounds because stories are an essential part of my life. So I'm wondering, yeah. having a theater and performance studies degree, what stories are important for you to hear or to share with the world? There are plenty of stories that are important to me, be they about my disability or not. As the director of Tellers, Charles Parrott himself said, every story says something about the human condition, even very simple ones. Someone from the same showcase, I don't know how much of the showcase you watch. If you haven't watched the whole thing, I highly recommend that you do. Someone from the same showcase did, his story was just about his time working at Publix. And he used it to talk about how it showed the underbelly of what it was like working in the retail industry. As for the future, I'm not entirely sure yet. Fear is not my focus for now, but I am opening to getting a few gigs here and there. My taste in theater is very particular. <laughs> and I definitely think that there will, there will always be a theatrical side to me in whatever I do because I spent so many years in a row working within the theater realm. I think stories so often incorporate the idea of community. And uh, you are the Community Engagement Officer for Autistic Inclusive Meets USA. Uh, the, the mission of Autistic Inclusive Meets USA, or AIM, is to enable families with autistic children and autistic individuals to get out into the community and socialize in an accepting, inclusive environment with like-minded peers. What types of opportunities in the community does AIM give autistic folks? AIM's focus is on countering pseudoscience as it relates to autism and hosting meetups for not only autistic kids, but autistic parents. The USA chapter just started a year ago. While it's been active in the UK for a few years now, and I think we're trying to recreate what they're doing in the UK. AIM is an organization oriented towards families and pseudoscience. I actually joined as a part of a merger from Fierce Autistics and Allies, which does very similar work. Didn't do as much of the family engagement, but it did a lot of the like quackery countering. Actually, I socialized my way into that organization because I just I met members and bonded with them. We're still figuring out what the general direction of the USA chapter will be, will be because we only merged a few months ago. But I do think the work that they do in the UK is pretty great, and it's nice that we're bringing that over here to the US. Now, AIM is a uh, not-for-profit organization created by autistic people. What do you see as the importance of, the, of organizations created and run by autistics? It's a great question. Organizations created and run by autistics are incredibly important to me. They generally get it much better than the autism organizations not led by autistic people. My general rule of thumb is to support autistic-led and creative ones over ones that are not. Honestly, most NT-led organizations miss the mark for me. Many of them really miss the mark. There are, however, autistic-led organizations that I also don't like, but it's comparatively few to the big stack of neurotypical-led organizations that I don't like. Gotcha. And how can uh, people learn more about Autistic Inclusive Meets USA? By going to our website and following us on social media. Great. And I, I will share the, those links in the uh, podcast description of the episode. So you're a recent college graduate. So what the, what the heck is next for you? Because I had no idea once I graduated. <laughs> yeah, I'm still figuring that out. Ideally, I'll eventually end up working for as in paid work for an autistic-led organization that I like, or at least some kind of self-advocacy organization. Amy USA is volunteer, so not paid. Until then, I'm looking for a part-time job. One thing I do know, actually two things I know that I have going for me is I have an internship coming up at the Hirsch Academy that's here in Decatur this fall, and I also actually just got hired as a substitute teacher for the Connection School of Atlanta. So both the Hirsch Academy and the Connection Schools are schools for neurodivergent youth. Usually those kinds of schools I kind of give the side eye to, but schools like do things really well. They presume competence. They like subscribe to the neurodiversity paradigm, and they listen to autistic people. They don't do 
ABA or any behaviorist kind of stuff. So I think uh, I think they're a good model for like if you're not going to if public schools aren't going to be more inclusive of autistic people, then these are the kinds of schools that there should that that should at least be an option, I guess. Like kind of like how there are schools for the deaf. Of course, I'm not saying all schools for the deaf are amazing, but like it seems like a, um, at least some of them do a really good job of suiting the needs of deaf people. So another thing I've been hard at work at is Autistic Archive, which I have the link to on my LinkedIn profile. I guess other than that, uh, I'll just see what happens. Yeah. I had a chance to uh, check out the Autistic Archive. I, I, I was definitely impressed by it. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah. So back in April, I, I saw, and even before that, I saw some like more experienced people in their diversity movement say that we need better archival of what's come before us. There are a lot of people who don't know the history of the neurodiversity mm. movement and the autistic community. And for a while, I had been interested in finding out more about that because I had read Loud Hands, and one of the first few chapters is the history of ANI, Autism Network International. It was the first like known autistic light organization in the U.S. that was really like for the cause of like autism acceptance and things like that. That chapter really interested me. And of course, I also really like Don't Mourn For Us, which is the most well-known speech from Jim Sinclair that was given at a conference in 1993. Like Loud Hands in general, since it's a bit old, it's almost a decade old, it gives you, it gives you a bit of an idea of where the neurodiversity movement comes from. And if you do some more research, like you look at Mel Baggs' materials, that'll also give you somewhat of an idea. I also used the web archive, the Wayback Machine, to look back at like what autistic websites there were. And I came across autistics.org, which has a lot of really great stuff on it. It's just a great website. I decided that, you know what, I'm going to step up and I'm going to do this archival work because it's needed. It's something that interests me. It also just, it gives you a, it gives you a picture of just the history of the internet in general, just when you look at the history of the neurodiversity movement. And internet history, like the old net and stuff fascinates me too. Like I, I miss how the internet was back in my childhood. Like it had some really cool aesthetics. So I just decided to get to work. I At first it was just, a, it was a bunch of folders on Google Drive, but then I put it to a website and I'm, there's still a lot that needs to be added to it. In fact, I actually just found something that uh, a lot of people thought had been lost for a long time. A lot of the early organization of autistic people occurred in Yahoo Groups, which is now defunct. Yahoo Groups was like really big back in the older days of the internet. I came across this rescue group that had saved a bunch of old Yahoo Groups. And I asked for, uh, they had this directory of the ones that they had, and I asked for the autistic ones. And they gave me this huge stack of Yahoo Groups messages, like six, more than 600 megabytes of messages, which is a lot. And I've been reading through that for a week now. And yeah, there's so much really fascinating stuff there. I'm figuring out how exactly I'm going to put it on the website. And there's even more I still haven't found from Yahoo Groups, but I'm in contact with them. So as long as I got them in my back pocket, I can try and rescue whatever there is. And I'm hoping I can rescue other old forums. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and I've, I also am flattered by all of the praise I've gotten for it. I'm hoping to get to do more and more with this Autistic Archive stuff. And hopefully it'll help a lot of people. Absolutely. You know, um, Autistic History has really been on my uh, mind and heart in the last month because someone that I had... Yeah interviewed on uh, Autism Stories about a year or so ago, Dinah Murray. She has passed away recently. Oh, Dinah Murray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. she was yeah. one of the people I had yeah. on there because a lot of the stuff I found from the web archive was stuff that she wrote or worked on. Um, yeah. I never knew Dinah personally, but it, it looks like she made some pretty good contributions to the neurodiversity movement. Two things in particular that I like from her that I saw were... Uh, so one thing, she helped work, and the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network helped work on this video. It's on my website if you, I think if you go to Dean Murray, if you go on there, it's a video called Something About Us, which is mm -hmm. like this very uplifting right. 
you know, that portrays autistic people in a positive light. And I think it was from the early 2010s, if I remember correctly. Sounds about right. I think, I'm trying to remember what other thing Dina Marie did that I really liked. I know she also had this project called a Positive, which was a blog that hosted a bunch of like videos made by autistic people. The blog itself is like, I mean, it's up on the web archives, but it's hard to, there isn't a whole lot you can really see there because the videos were put on there using Flash and Flash is dead. I know there was an effort to archive things from Adobe Flash. I think mainly Adobe uh, Flash games. I, I don't know if they captured that. I think, if I remember correctly, it was called Flashpoint. Let's see. Yeah, it was Pause Out I was just making sure. Yeah, uh, may her memory be a blessing. I've archived her work. Keep up the great work, Ira. It was, it was truly a, a very enjoyable conversation. Thanks for making the time to talk with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks so much to Ira for the conversation. To learn more about the Autistic Archive, check out the link in the podcast description of this episode. If you would like to learn beyond this podcast how Autism Personal Coach can help you to reduce your daily overwhelm and get the things that you need and want in your life, then book a Zoom call with me today. A link to book the call can be found in the podcast description of this episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable experience as you, it would very much be appreciated. On next week's episode of Autism Stories, we will discuss occupational therapy and developing community. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.